thank you. Um, can I say good afternoon, everyone? And I'm so chilled out. I'm going to have to really now get myself into the groove to talk about simulations. So it's a real privilege. So uh, my name is Mandy. I currently work as a senior lecturer at Staffordshire University um, around patient safety and simulation. And uh, along with Jill, I'm actually a doctoral education research student at the Open University. So, so two, two hats today. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about simulation, um, my research journey to date, and then I've got a few ideas of where I think it would help all of us working with technology for both our learners and the learning and maybe how we see ourselves. And this should take about 20 minutes, so to allow time for discussion. So a little bit about me, um, I am a nurse by profession, so there is Simulator Mandy in the middle, that's my Lego figure. Um, so I trained as a nurse back in the 1980s um, at the Nightingale School of Nursing, wearing a hat and an apron, really, really traditional. Um, and then after specialising in cardiac nursing, I went to work in education, and then I joined the Bristol Medical Simulation Centre, and Bristol's unique in simulation. It was the first centre in Europe, so it was lovely to work there. Uh, best job ever. And, um, and then I decided I wanted to try something different in simulation, so I went to work for industry for an American company called METI that was bought by a company called CAE, and I ended up travelling all over the world looking at lots of simulation with lots of different types, and then along the way realised that I had gaps in my knowledge and I was trying to figure out some questions, and that led me to joining INAXEL, a global society, um, and being one of their faculty and starting a, a, a doctoral degree. And then as I began my doctoral journey, I changed it. Anybody that studies, it transforms you at any level. And then an opening appeared at Staffordshire and I joined the team about 18 months ago. So I'm quite unique. I think that I've worked in simulation in an NHS setting, a commercial setting and now in an academic setting. And this will underpin my story today. But this is always a journey. Um, for all of us, there are people along the way. So I just need to acknowledge my supervision team at the Open University, uh, Thea and Bart, the rest of the OU team, and the wonderful colleagues here at Staffordshire, because again, it's a team approach. So simulation. So if you think what simulation is, there are lots and lots of definitions, and those definitions will be really from your context. So simulation is in law, it's in business studies, police, aviation, defence, security, science. So this is quite a generic definition, but I really like this for people that are in the real world because it talks about practising skills either as an individual or in teams, looking at real world learning, thinking about safety of maybe themselves or the people they're working with and alongside. But for today, I'm going to situate it in healthcare. So this is my working definition for my current doctoral research. I'm calling it an education strategy. Now there is a debate, is simulation based education unique or is it an arm of our teaching pedagogies? And that's an ongoing debate. I believe it has immersive technologies. Pictures are coming, but nothing gory. I made sure I didn't do anything horrible today. And I think you can use it for teaching and learning rehearsal so maybe you've been working in a role for a while and you want to try out some new ways or new ways of working you can certainly use it for assessment or feedback and for me it's about that safe patient or client care now at staffordshire we're very fortunate we have three simulation centers one at shrewsbury one at stoke but the 5.4 million pound simulation centre is at Stafford. And here are just a couple of pictures of the Stafford Centre, which is called the Centre for Health Innovation. If you ever get a chance to come to Stafford, please come and visit us. Um, it's it's purpose built. Um, and these are three pictures. So one with the car is in our large immersive space where you can drive an ambulance in. Uh, you can portray any background. We can do tropical rainforest. It hasn't just got to be health. Then we have a flat which has several rooms so you can do really cool things with a, your own front door 
And we also have a series of clinical spaces uh, to be acute care settings. So my colleague deck there is caring for an interactive mannequin that breathes, that cries. Um, and we use a range of technology, including people taking on characteristics of behaviours. So it is really beautiful. And for us, we're looking at student nurses, ODPs, paramedics, midwives, social workers, scientists, psychologists, sports scientists, police, and anyone else that wants to come and join us. But if we think about simulation-based education, this is the sort of traditional way most people are doing it globally. We have our simulation design based on a needs analysis, thinking about the level of the learners, what you want to do, the types of technologies. You then decide how many learners you want to care for your patient or client, for me in health. Everybody else will be watching, often in another room. In the pre-brief, you orientate them to the environment, what those learning outcomes are, thinking about psychological safety, that's really important. Some learners will do the care in this scenario, everyone else is watching. And then afterwards, the facilitator leads um, a debrief where everyone talks about what was seen, what was done, what was the critical thinking behind it. So celebrating success, but get them to understand that, but also where maybe they could have done a different approach. And then you can measure the learning or confidence. Now, when you look at the literature, loads is written about design, loads on pre-brief, even more on debrief, loads on evaluation, but nothing much on scenarios. And that's where I became curious. So as someone that's a facilitator myself and teaches people how to facilitate, I was often asked when the learners are in the scenario phase, sometimes they look a bit frightened, a little bit anxious, or they don't really seem very confident. And you want to support them to achieve the learning. This is for teaching and learning, not for assessment. So how do you know? For me, I just make it up. I spoke to peers across the world. We're all just like, oh, we just do stuff because it works. And that actually was one of my reasons for doing the PhD, was to try and improve my practice and other people's practice to share, hopefully. But when I looked at the guidelines, and I'm not expecting you to read this, it's very small. There are international guidelines. Um, the UK Simulation Society, this is an Axel. They all say very similar things. They say use cues or prompts to support the learning. They don't tell you when to cue. They don't tell you if queuing works and they only come at it to support the learning outcomes. So how do you know? And to give some examples of what I mean by queuing, and this is from the literature and from what people are doing, um, let's imagine the patient's got pain. And if the learners aren't picking up the pain because maybe they're frightened or they've got what's called performance anxiety, what we can do is we can, if we're voicing a mannequin, give different words or go, oh, it's really hurting. Or we can use what's called an embedded participant and someone goes into the room, maybe as a family member or another healthcare professional and says, oh, Mr. Smith looks like he's in a lot of pain. What's going on here? Or if you've got a monitor, you can increase blood pressure or change your heart rate. Or suddenly a phone can ring up and give data that helps them figure it out. Now, the one I have never, ever, ever used is what's called in the literature voice of God, where a, a voice comes in over a speaker and tells them what to do. I've never been a fan of that, but there are people that use it. And then the final example is the facilitator actually pauses a scenario and regroups. So that's what this, the guidelines say is do some of them. But again, how do you know what to do and does it work? So this is the sort of landscape um, that I'm fascinated by and I spend my life thinking about it. So um, I went to do a literature review to think, well, does my feelings and what people are telling me in the simulation community, is it just me thinking this? So I went to the literature and I'm not going to explain all my criteria, but I chose 1999. And this is a key date in nursing in the UK. 
at the end of the sort of late 80s, early 90s, nurse training began to move from the apprenticeship system into higher education. And the first few years that that was going on, a big report was commissioned by the regulator, which is now called the Nursing Midwifery Council, but back then was called the UKCC, a bit of a brand change, um, by Sir Leonard Peach. And he found that there were some problems with the new curriculum which is going to happen, but he made a series of recommendations, one of which was that every university should have skills and simulation areas. So all the literature I looked at was after this big um, piece of work. And what was really interesting when I began to sift through the papers and I sort of went for about 201, I found when I sifted through, I found 31 that met my criteria. And these were in three themes. One theme was very much that students love simulation. But when you really looked at the papers, it, they were comparing skills teaching using plastic arms to an interactive mannequin. Well, a lot of people love technology. So was it the novelty factor? They also measured speed of doing a task. Well, I don't think speed of a task equals safety. Being fast doesn't mean you're safe. It just means you're fast. The other sets of papers looked at the role of the facilitator, the educator. Um, and there was some work saying that facilitators need to be trained to facilitate. So facilitators from that lovely Latin word facilitate to enable. So you need to move from being a sage on the stage. I'm saging a bit at the minute to being that guide on the side based on Alison King's work. And that there was an, a problem with how do you do it? Not a lot written about what the learners think. And they are part of this. There were about four papers I found from the learner's perspective. And one paper said learners said that facilitators queue too quickly because they've got to do some thinking or queue too late or don't bother. Other papers said that the cues that are being used, this increase in the monitor vital signs or the patient calling out in pain are fictional cues. Real people don't behave like that. So we need to try and think about it. So my gut feeling of no one knows really what they're doing and we're all making it up in the world of queuing and prompting, the literature says there is a gap, which I was really pleased about because if not, it would have been a bit of a disaster, but there is a gap. There's not a lot written and still isn't. So these are the research questions. These were initially very large, but I've narrowed. Uh, I'm narrowing again. Is I wanted to look at it from not just a facilitator piece, but also from the learner piece. So to get both perspectives, because I think then that's going to help us in the world of education, be it in an academic place or in the workplace. So what I decided to do was um, do a pilot study. I'm a novice researcher. This was my first go at doing what I'm going to say is real research. Uh, so. After lots of toing and throwing, I went with an explanatory descriptive case study to try and find out what was going on here and now. And I chose to use semi-structured questions, only five for students and facilitators. Ethics was granted and I began last June and July off trying to collect this data. I chose to use Microsoft Teams because you can transcribe in that. Um, and then I sent all of the people that participated their scripts back and where the medical terms weren't quite captured, I rewrote them in a different color and said, is this what you, you thought? And then I began the data analysis. And because I, I'm very new at this, I tried to find a way that worked for me and for what I was trying to do. So I, I went with Braun and Clark's six a step thematic approach based on their 22 textbook. I chose them because I, I attended some of their webinars last year. I felt very inspired. I thought I can do this. I can familiarize myself with the data. I can do a bit of coding for the first time. Um, they say very clearly themes do not emerge. They're very clear on that, that you generate themes and we all have a bias. So the way I've, I've done the themes comes from my bit of bias. Then I can create these thematic maps. Now, this was a pilot. There are limitations with this study. 
and you'll see it straight away that I was aiming for five facilitators and I got four. The student nurse didn't go so well my recruitment. Now, I had loads of student nurses that were keen, we spoke. For some reason, they were felt unable to sign the consent form and I didn't want to pressure them because of a power thing. That's something I'm going to, I'm changing now because I'm recruiting for the main study. However, it did give me a chance to have a go. And I think from the facilitator piece, I've pulled out some interesting initial ideas and the student nurse spoke for over 50 minutes. But, I, but I'm mindful that when you see some of this, it's, it is pilot data. So here we go. Um, I didn't know how to code. I didn't use Envivo. And because I had such a small, I literally sat on my carpet and I cut up all of the text. Um, and I found this by by hearing uh, Braun and Clark on their early webinar last year. Uh, somebody said they were doing that. So I felt really inspired that I was actually cutting out the data and rearranging into lots of themes. And it was really organic. And I really felt I know the data really well because I've cut those pieces up. I've looked at them. I've moved them around. Um, and I did this over a two week period. And um, in my home, there was just a bits of text everywhere and nobody could actually cover the carpet. So, but it worked. From this, I created my first uh, idea map and I will spend a few minutes on this. So um, I'm gonna look at the facilitator piece first. The four facilitators, one of the questions I asked them was, how long have you been a simulation facilitator and what training have you had? And there were two groups. There was a group between five and 10 years who'd had multiple training and had simulated in academic and clinical settings and two within about a year. What was really interesting, all of the facilitators said that they intervened in that scenario phase when the students look stressed. So what I call reading of the learners. And I said, well, how do you know they were stressed? And they said they were sweating, they looked pale, they were mumbling, they just looked in fear. So we, we felt we had to go in. They also said that they also intervened, what I'm calling modality at the moment. When the technology didn't do what they wanted it to do, they intervened. And my follow-up question was, when you piloted your design, was that maybe not something we you had thought about? And none of them had piloted their designs. They went live. That's OK, because I often don't. So because I'm a real world simulation teacher. They also intervened when they thought the learners were going to break the technology because it's expensive. And one gave a lovely example. They were using a person who was distressed of a human. And the learners were trying to give them an injection that were really going to give them an injection. And obviously, we can't really let that happen. But the really fascinating piece from the facilitator piece was a conflict. A lot of them said that the reason they cued or prompted was when in the scenario, the learners were doing the wrong thing, not necessarily unsafe, but not the way it should be done. And when I said, but why did you do that? Because we're in a teaching and learning. They felt that it was about their professional registration. So they said they had conflict being a registered practitioner and a facilitator. And they were worried that the students would think that they didn't know what they were doing if they didn't intervene, which was really interesting. They all said this. And then I we had a discussion. Well, that's what the debrief is for. So is there something about the way we maybe train our facilitators? Or is it something that when you've got a professional registration that you have this sort of internal jeopardy thing? I'm not sure. The lovely student nurse, and again, they talked about drilling. This, they kept saying that the more times you do simulation, the better it is, and that would link to Ericsson's model of repeated practice. But also that there were certain things you have to do to be a registered nurse, and it's about getting it right. So I think there is a link there to professional identity. They also said, and this was fascinating, that because they had multiple facilitators, they got to learn which facilitator liked which thing or didn't. So they said when X it was facilitating, if we got the drugs wrong, they always come in. We know that. So we often ask for help on their thing. So this concept of the learner reading the facilitators. So having generated the first uh, thematic um, map, I then went back to my carpet 
looked again and came up with where I am today. So I've got three themes here. So I think support is given due to this concept of psychological and physical safety, that you're intervening. Um, and you look at best practice and research, psychological safety is key. But the bit that I wasn't expecting and was a complete shock, but a great, that's why you do research, is this concept of identity and agency, that there's this conflict, particularly in the facilitator group. And everybody, both the student and the facilitator said, we need support to hit the learning outcomes, which is what those guidelines say. But now I then had a reflection moment. So I thought, OK, I've got to this stage. But am I really answering my original research questions? Uh, no, not really. Yes, I'm learning what people are doing, but I'm not really finding out, is it the right thing? And what was fascinating in my discussions with my all of my participants, they all said, uh, Mandy, if only you, you could have shown us, because I said, oh, from your memory, can you tell me about a scenario where you needed support or gave support, depending on who I was asking? And they said, oh, and they were trying to remember it. So I realised that I need to do something about that for the main study. And this is what I'm embarking on at the minute. I'm currently recruiting. So I'm going to be using video elicitation. Within um, two of uh, the campuses, we actually have a uh, video recording that we can access to see all of it. And what I'm planning to do is, and all the consents are in place, is record on the learner side about a minute before support is given. So I'm going to show that piece of film and then ask them to talk about what happened, their feelings and thoughts. Did what was given work for them and why? And I will be using the transcripts of what they say, not the video footage. The video footage is only there as a memory prompt. I will describe the stories uh, for the thesis because it will make no sense. And on the facilitator side, I will do a similar thing. I, a minute before, before the facilitators either do their thing and ask them why they chose to do what it is they chose to do and why and get that rationale. On the facilitator side, I recognise because I will be showing the film, I will ask them for their simulation designs as well because we're able to do that. But also they have the option to watch in their whole film in case I've missed some of what they termed support. And I will use that thematic analysis. So why I wanted to share my pilot work to date is because I think there's some things that are beginning to maybe come out that I think are useful for us um, for the learners that we serve and for maybe um, the way we facilitate using technology. So I think the first thing is our, our conceptions of facilitation. What is a facilitator? Particularly that tension if you've got a professional hat on as well. And if the learners are working across a module with several facilitators, I'm not saying we should all do the same thing, but maybe we need a common approach that works for those type of learners in that context. So I think this links very nicely to this role conflict. And I think maybe we need to think about some of these themes when we think about of our, um, our training of facilitators in simulation-based education. Um, Health Education England are looking at a national training programme, but we need to think about this because simulation facilitators can come from clinical backgrounds, from technical backgrounds, from science backgrounds, from a range of backgrounds. So we do need to think about that. If we're involving learners for learning's sake, then surely we need to involve the voice of them. What are our learners' needs? And that might change. That's why I'm trying to capture the voice of the learner um, and I'm going onto campus over the next couple of months, meeting all the groups of learners who hopefully um, will consent for me to do this with them. I realised that I did it all virtually in my pilot study and they just need to meet me and I need to you know that's learning about how to do the research and then the final thing is if we're using technology and i love technology as a simulation teacher we really need to think how technology is used but also how we introduce it to our learners and our facilitators it's not just a case of learning how to use it it's how to teach with it what are those strategies and what support can we have so those are my sort of implications to date so 
I've hopefully given you a little bit of an insight into my world as a healthcare simulation teacher and my research journey to date um, and some top tips. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And there's both my email, um, miniature Mandy again in Lego, but also my Twitter feed.